بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم ما بعد Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope everyone's doing well, staying warm and healthy and strong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq to do khair and learn and practice inshallah. So in the previous lessons we spoke um, extensively somewhat about uh, Islam, Iman, then we talked about Ihsan as well. So now we wanted to focus on certain uh, things to that will motivate us to to attempt to reach the level of ihsan. So we discussed ihsan, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about it in the Quran, how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about it in the hadith, some statements of the the Sufis or the, the pious people in the past, uh, the pious predecessors regarding ihsan. And now we want to talk a little bit about the fruits of Ihsan. What will we get once we reach Ihsan or in the process of getting Ihsan? What is the benefits? So now Ihsan is basically as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he summarized everything we spoke about in Ihsan in, in that one statement. And that's a, a testament to him having the mu'jizah or the miracle of Jami' al-Kalim. Utitu uh, Jawami' al-Kalim. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have been given Jawami' al-Kalim as a mu'ajiza or a miracle. And that is that everything, um, or, or Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about many things and he summarized a lot in very few words. So if you think about it, everything that we discussed regarding Ihsan, how intricate it is, how much information there is, how deep it goes. If you really think about it, it is summarized in that statement of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And ta'abud Allah ka annaka tarahu fa illam takun tarahu fa innahu yarak. And in there, there's so many secrets and, and, and you know, treasures. We talked about mushahada, we talked about ikhlas, we talked about different stages, we talked about so much. So essentially, it is what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So here we have that if we worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if we could see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what are, what are the outcomes of this? What would happen if we were able to do this? Number one, we would have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now these are the qualities that we gain when we have ihsan. And if we recite the Quran or if we read a translation or we understand the Quran, then we will see these qualities uh, mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. So one way for us to get these qualities is to have ihsan. Number one is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-khashya or khawf. Uh, khawf is apprehension. Fear of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and khawf. The difference between khashya and, and khawf is, is very subtle. Khashya would be to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based off of reverence. Right? I know we have reverence after there, but... Uh, the the fear that is built upon reverence, uh, when the the type of respect and awe that you have for um, a leader or your parents or your teacher, that to a, a very magnified degree, that would be khashya. And khauf, I wrote here, apprehension, is actual like fear of the punishment. So there's there's a difference between khashya and khauf. We would have both of these qualities if we worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if we could see Allah. Khashya we would have because we would we would definitely revere Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we do, but it would be a continuous reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that would develop that fear. And then the khawf would be because we are aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can punish us for this the slightest uh, sin that we commit. We definitely have the, the hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he won't, 
but we realize that any sin that we do, we are accountable for those sins. So that's where the khawf comes from. And then we have al-hayba. Hayba, I wrote, I translate it as awe. Hayba is also a type of a khawf. All of these are similar here, uh, these four qualities. So hayba means that a person is overwhelmed. So at times, if, if we are always aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there will be times when we are overwhelmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, uh, you know, his power, his might, his, his, his qualities. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us to be aware that he is there. So if we could truly understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, his might, his power, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do to us at any moment, these qualities would come into us. And of course, reverence, at ta'alim, or holding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in such respect. I mean, there are certain scholars alive even today uh, and, and who passed away in recent times. I've heard stories about them where some of them won't ever stretch their legs out. And to us, to us, that seems extreme. Like when you're sitting down, we at times we'll stretch our legs out. That's just to stretch. These people out of ta'alim and, and reverence and always being aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they feel like it'll be disrespectful if they show that they are uh, enjoying. And that is, you know, in, in our context, it would be a bit extreme, but this is an involuntary stage that they reached where it would be to them, it seemed very disrespectful. For an example, many of us, uh, especially the, the Hufal, because they've studied uh, traditionally uh, with their, their health teacher and went through that whole process, if they would not like to stretch their legs towards the Qibla, or they would not like to stretch their legs towards the Quran, or they would not like to be on a higher surface or a higher level and the quran be on a lower level say for instance there's like you know um a table or something so the quran is on a lower table and they stand on top of a higher table they wouldn't like that now, to some of us that would seem you know excessive a bit but that comes into a person because of the the environment they're in well if a person is continuously thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some of these stages also come into a person so you know at times things may seem very difficult for us to to imagine but for others it's very uh, understandable so these qualities this first point here these are the qualities that prevent us from committing sin if we are afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power, continuously imagining that he has full power over everything, and we know that he can punish us for the slightest mistake that we make. Then, if this comes into us, these are all branches of us worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if we can see him. So then, this would aid us in, in uh, preventing us from committing sin. There's a hadith here narrated by Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. He says, Awsani Khalili sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an akhsha allaha ka anni arahu fa illam akun arahu fa innahu yarani. A very similar hadith to what we we're speaking about here, the hadith of Jibreel. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu says, My best friend sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is referring to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My best friend had uh, gave me advice that I should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if I can see him. If I cannot see him, then he sees me. So this is very similar to what we were talking about where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, An ta'bud Allah, that you worship Allah as if you can see him. If you cannot see him, then he sees you. But instead in this hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Abu Dhar the same thing, but that he should fear Allah as if he can see Allah. If he cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees him. Which means that worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see him is very similar or, or is the foundation to have this branch that comes out, which is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see him. And in another narration, Waruya an ibn Umar, narrated by ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, he said, أَخَذَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِبَعْضِ جَسَدِي فَقَالَ أُعْبُدُ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَهُ 
So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it says he, he grabbed Ibn Umar. Either this means that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held his hand, or it can mean like what I imagine is that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, you know, tried to alert Ibn Umar by grabbing him. You know, just to show him the severity or the importance of what he is going to say. Ibn Umar obviously was, was a young man. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held him and he said, worship Allah as if you can see him. To, to show the, the importance of the message that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was giving. So these have an, a, a huge effect. Uh, Ihsan has a huge effect on us, uh, preventing us from sin. If we are involved in sin that we want to get away from, we want to make tawbah, but we're so attached to this sin or this distraction, and we find it very difficult. Perhaps we, one way we can get out of that is to try to develop ihsan, to try to meditate uh, throughout the day, meaning an, an active meditation, not where you're just sitting down in a quiet corner and imagining, but a continuous imagination throughout the day where None of your basic duties and, and your, your work and your job and, and your chores are affected. But in the back of our minds, we are consciously aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. This would greatly uh, help us to get over these uh, negative aspects in our life. So that's the first point. If we had ihsan, we would essentially have the fear and reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which would greatly aid us in uh, you know, preventing us from committing sin. Point number two here is that other qualities that we would gain from this would be shame. And this is uh, called al-haya. So haya in Islam, haya over our actions. So the first point was it should stop us from committing the sin. The second point is that if we happen to commit the sin or sins in the past, then having ihsan would allow us to feel bad for those actions. Uh, it would also uh, create within us a nadam. In Arabic, a nadam means uh, you know, sorrow for our actions that we have, the negative actions that we have done, sorrow. And obviously, nadam in one hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a nadam is tawbah. So if you have a nadam and you have that sorrow and you have that remorse that you have committed something wrong in the past, that in itself is Toba. That is the essence of Toba, really. If we're you know, doing Toba and we're just saying, oh Allah, I, I want to do Toba, I won't do it again, but that sorrow is, in, is not in our hearts, then it's not a complete Toba. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the Quran says, Tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha. Make a pure Toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, this verse itself in the Quran tells us when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to make a pure tawbah, a khalis tawbah, it tells us there's different stages of tawbah. So the highest stages of tawbah is when a person's, you know, his tongue, his or her tongue is saying, I am sorry. The actions of the body are refraining from the sin and the heart itself regrets. And the regret of the heart is the highest level of tawbah. And that's why in the hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, nadam at tawbah. Tawbah itself, uh, nadam or remorse itself is tawbah. So ihsan would be really uh, helpful in gaining these qualities of haya, shame for the actions that we have committed, the negative actions, and to be repentant. So in this hadith, yurwa min hadith Abi, Abi Umama, the hadith of Abu Umama, Rasulullah gave advice to a person Rasulullah gave advice to this person that have shame regarding your actions in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the same way that you would have shame in front of two people two pious people of your family who never leave you. So this could be referring to the parents, the mother and the father. Uh, many of us have heard in school when we were being raised that, you know, would you behave in this manner if your parents were watching you? When we were children, we heard this. So Rasulullah is telling him that have that much haya and 
shamefulness for your actions in front of Allah, which means when you're by yourself, have that much shame, just like you would in front of two people, two pious people in your family who never separate from you. So there's another hadith as well. Uh, there's one narrated by Mu'adh, the second here, second hadith here. Anna Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wassahu lama ba'athahu ilal yaman. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Mu'adh radiyallahu anhu to Yemen as a governor uh, around the end of his life. So this was a very emotional time for Mu'adh radiyallahu anhu because when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent him to Yemen as the governor of Yemen, and he did so because Mu'adh was one of the greatest scholars amongst the Sahaba, Mu'adh radiyallahu anhu knew that this was the last time he would meet Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him some clues that you won't meet me when you come back. So you're going to Yemen, I'm sending you right now, you're not going to see me again. And then in that situation, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him some advices. Amongst them, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Istahyi min Allahi kama tastahyi rajulan dha haybatin min ahlik. Have uh, you know, be ashamed of your actions before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as you would be ashamed before a person who has a lot of reverence in your family. Your father, your uncle, people that you hold in high esteem, you wouldn't want to do these actions in front of them. So you should have that type of haya and shamefulness in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are by yourself. So this is also another fruit of ihsan. So number one, the first fruit is that we will have that fear, that real, what is, what is the essence of taqwa. So taqwa comes into our lives. If we ever wondered, how do we get taqwa? I heard about this term taqwa. How do we get it? It is through that fear and consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of these qualities are very high, lofty qualities. And sometimes we're very confused. How do we get them? And, and we hear about ihsan. How do we get ihsan? But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that you should have ikhlas first. And we talked about what ikhlas is. It's just awareness of Allah. Just begin with very small baby steps, being aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can do this for a limited amount of time. I spoke about this before in the previous lessons. 10 minutes. Let's take, you know, practice every day. 10 minutes, Allah is watching me. Or you can increase on that. And then when it, it, it gets larger and larger, these qualities will come out from that. Okay. So now the third quality from Ihsan is that we would have sincerity in worship. An nushu fil ibadah. So ikhlas, purity in our worship. When we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this, this is basically the, the main fruit of Ihsan, is, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if we see Him. So we will have that sincerity. When we worship, our mind won't wander. We will be aware that we are... We are worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we wonder how, you know, certain people when they're praying salah, we might have seen some people that they're crying, tears are coming down their face. And it's just because they're aware that they're in front of the, the king of the universe. Uh, the, the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran, so very beautiful that uh, many of us recite before we start our salah. However, we might not even know what it means. So this is the statement of Ibrahim. And this is exactly what uh, Ihsan should do to us. The, the statement, the translation is, I have turned my face. Uh, I have turned my attention, my face, my heart, my intellect, everything towards the, the being that created the heavens and the earth. Hanifan, in such a condition that I am solely for him. I have cut off myself from every single thing other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And I do not ascribe any partners with Allah. And what is the, the benefit of us saying that as Muslims, that we don't do shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The definition of a Muslim is that they don't do shirk at all. So what is the purpose of us saying not to do that we don't do shirk? It means that we are engaging in salah. We are about to start salah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, communication. And I am not going to ascribe any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of my attention. My attention is only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My intellect, I am going to be aware of what I recite. 
I'm going to be aware that I'm in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to be aware that I am in, in communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I won't do shirk with Allah. I won't turn my attention to anything other than Allah. So many of us recite this, this beautiful dua before we uh, start our salah. And this is the dua of uh, tawajju, of getting us to, to pay attention to salah. So many of, uh, you know, in the Shafi'i madhab, this is more emphasized than in the Hanafi madhab. However, every madhab, they, they accept this dua and we recite this dua before salah. The purpose of the dua is to get us to be aware. So this is also a part of ihsan. So this is a, uh, here in this uh, second point here, the hadith of Haditha. It's a very beautiful uh, hadith where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Haditha, this was a sahabi, his name is Haditha, anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala lahu, kayfa asbahta ya Haditha? Oh Haditha, how did you uh, wake up today? How was your morning? So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met this sahabi and he's saying, how are you doing? How was your morning? What did he reply? Qala asbahtu mu'minan haqqa. He said, I have woke up today as a true believer. Mu'minan haqqa, I am an absolutely true believer today. Qal, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Unthun ma taqul, fa inna li kulli qawlin haqiqa. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, be careful of what you say. Every statement has an essence to it. Every statement has a reality behind it. So if you are not, if you do not possess that reality, then you're not telling the truth. So basically he's saying, I am a true believer today. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, watch out, be careful. What is the proof behind that? So then he, he responds with the proof. قَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ عَزَفْتُ نَفْسِ عَنِ الدُّنْيَا فَأَسْهَرْتُ لَيْلِي وَأَضْمَأْتُ نَهَارِي وَكَأَنِّي أَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ عَرْشِ رَبِّ بَارِزَةً he said something very beautiful. He said, Oh, Rasulullah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have kept myself away from the pleasures of dunya so much so that I have stayed awake at night in worship and I have stayed hungry in my days out of fasting. So much so, it is as if I can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's arsh in front of me, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can see it. And I can see the people of Jannah, how they're visiting one another. And as if I can see the people of Jahannam and how they're howling out of, out of being in torment and pain. So he uh, abstained from dunya so much and he didn't involve himself in the pleasures of dunya. He worshipped all night and he would fast every day. And he would basically imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was watching him at all times. And the effect of this was that he felt as if he could see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's arsh. And remember when we talk about seeing, we're talking about sight with the heart. He felt like, you know, he imagined Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being, uh, you know, always there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there, but he is imagining this so much that now it's become involuntary where he, he feels above him there's arsh. He can feel the people of Jannah. He can feel the people of Jahannam because he's, he's trained himself so much. So what did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say to him? Qala absarta falzam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that you have seen the truth. Stick to it. Don't let go. Abdun nawar Allahu al-imana fi qalbi. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said regarding him, this is a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has lit in the lamp of iman inside his heart. So this is another effect of ihsan where we will have true sincerity in worship. Our worship will become khalis and pure for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very beautiful hadith, what this individual did. And this is the sahabi, so we can really learn from this. The, the more we connect with dunya, the, the more we introduce into our lives, the more we are filling our hearts up. And the more we disconnect with dunya, the more our hearts become open for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. And the more we fast, the more we do ibadah, on condition we are doing so with the quality of ihsan, then this can be our situation as well. And many ulama have spoken about uh, certain individuals who also felt the same way, uh, whether, you know, 
they literally saw the arsh or not that is another discussion can the arsh be seen by individuals so there have been reports people you know actually have have reached such a level where they they are imagining or they see the arsh of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their dreams etc but this is a very high level of of ihsan then the next point is that we would have patience for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake if we are aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us at all times, we would definitely have patience. If we have any difficulties, the benefit of knowing that that difficulty came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we can meet that difficulty in the proper attitude and manner. If, if something difficult happens to us, a difficulty comes to us, and we're not thinking properly, we're not, we're not in the state of ihsan, then we'll be very upset. We'll try. Our attitude will, would reflect that. <clears throat> Our attitude would reflect that. Um, but if we know that every good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every bad comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever we deem to be bad in our lives, then we'll gladly have patience. Uh, there's a very high level um, amongst those uh, different terminologies that I spoke to you about of, of the soul called uh, rida. Just being pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, this individual is pleased with it. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether he has financial success, whether he doesn't, they're just content, completely content with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is another uh, facet of ihsan. We will have that sabr and patience. When any, when any difficulty comes to us, we will be patient because we know it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some people even take it on as a gift from Allah. That Allah is testing me right now. And he, if I pass this test, I will get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is, he is giving me this test. And inshallah, I will pass it. I will be patient. And then they are patient. And then their level gets closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, the second quality here, we would be abstinent from dunya as well. So sometimes we wonder, how do these people, why are they so abstinent? Why was Imam Nawawi so abstinent from dunya? That when he was passing away, he wanted a, a halal apple. You know, he just wanted a fruit. But then too, when he was dying, he still didn't eat it. So what gave him that that impetus, that 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 you know, that motivation not to take partake of that fruit, even though it's completely halal, is that he knew that what was waiting for him in the hereafter was much better. And that that is the first food that he had in the hereafter. So this is how they develop this, this quality of zuhud or abstinence from dunya. Not partaking of anything of dunya except that which they require. Uh, you know, doing everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being selfless. Uh, and the opposite of that is a person who does not have ihsan, they, they may become selfish because they feel like they want to amass the dunya. And the third quality here is we would adopt piety, which is al-wara, piety. Uh, and then the next one we would be chaste al -ifa. so chastity is very important in the life of a believer especially uh, before marriage it's extremely important that we have that ability to hold ourselves back and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us this is you know one of the greatest uh, difficulties for the youth that they have to go through this and uh, you know through ihsan, if we have ihsan, if we're continuously remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the best thing that can that can aid us in this regard. Uh, there's nothing more that can uh, help us more than this. Being aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me at every moment, uh, you know, and, and that would really help us not to slip up. And also we would develop good characteristics. So as we can see, ihsan is like the, the roots of the tree of iman. When we have ihsan, our iman will become strong. The branches would come out. And all of these qualities that we're talking about, these are the branches of that tree. And the foundation of that tree is ihsan. So if we have ihsan, these branches will come out. And if we try to, if we attempt to get these qualities without first developing ihsan, then it'll backfire. I'm sure many of us, I can speak, uh, you know, through experience, we try to gain certain qualities. We want this specific quality. We want zuhud. 
We want iffa, we want sabar, we want wara', we want an nusuhu fil ibadah, we want khawf, we want khashya. But because we didn't develop ihsan, we can sustain these individual characteristics, you know, perhaps for a week, two weeks, three weeks. And then something happens where it just backfires. And then we find ourselves worse than when we started. That, that's, you know, it, it's, it's a common phenomenon that happens with people. And the real reason behind this is because we're not basing these, these qualities off of the, the foundation of Ihsan. If we first develop Ihsan as our foundation, these qualities will become a natural outcome of that. So really, if we, we start having the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll see all good characteristics. Everything will, will sprout out from that. Next quality here, we'll develop love, al-mahabba, love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a very, very amazing quality. The individual that has love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like they've gained everything. Because this is not, you know, this person will do ibadah, this person will do everything naturally. It'll become very natural for him to, to perform salah. It'll be very natural for her to give sadaqah. You know, to, to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be happy if I give my money in his cause, and this person's in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they don't mind. They'll, they'll spend everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then a person will get uns familiarity or intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like become a, a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then and communion, al-munajat wal-ma'iyya. Munajah is like the whispering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we make dua, do we feel like we're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we make dua? How do we feel? Do we feel like we're talking to ourselves when we make dua? Uh, do we feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening? Or do we feel like we're just, we're just speaking and we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to listen? We can gauge how close we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our du'as alone. So when we have ihsan, our du'as are no longer, you know, requests to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our du'as become speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a very high level. And we see uh, Ya'aqub alayhi salam in uh, Surah to Yusuf, he had this quality. Obviously, he was a nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, innama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah. He said, I complain of my difficulty and my sorrow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he wasn't even talking about dua. He was talking about complaining only to Allah. So this meant that when he made dua, he would actually speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about his day. He would talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about his worries and concerns. This really helped him, you know, deal with the, the sorrow of losing Yusuf alayhi salam. So this munajah, communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, actual friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not uh, viewing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as just, you know, a being that's there, but rather having a personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, ma'iyya, being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all branches that stem from ihsan. This next hadith, we already did this hadith, narrated by Abi Umama Uma radiallahu anhu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, he who loves for the sake of Allah and who dislikes for the sake of Allah and who gives in charity for the sake of Allah and who reprimands for the sake of Allah, then their iman is complete. And the best way to, do, to form this is ihsan. Like I said before, if we just say, I want to love for the sake of Allah, so we find a brother or we find a sister in the masjid that we don't know and we want to develop that connection that we are, you know, brothers or sisters in Islam. So then, you know, we speak to them. And so after some time, we develop a connection and, you know, we feel like we love for the sake of Allah. But then this brother or sister, they hurt us in some way. They do something that we dislike. And all of a sudden, that relationship that we wanted to build for the sake of Allah becomes enmity. So what happened here? Ihsan was missing. If we truly had Ihsan at that moment, we would realize that if they did something wrong to me, I still love them for the sake of Allah because I never love them for my own sake. So if they do me wrong, then who cares? I love them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. So Ihsan is really the backbone for all of these good characteristics. The next hadith after that, An Ka'ab radiallahu anhu qal, Man aqama salata wa ata zaka wa sami'a wa ata'a he who establishes salah, pays zakah, 
listens to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger and obeys, then they have entered the center of Iman. وَمَنْ أَحَبَّ لِلَّهِ وَأَبْغَضَ لِلَّهِ وَأَعْطَى لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ عَلِ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ الْإِيمَانِ And he who loves for the sake of Allah, dislikes for the sake of Allah, gives for the sake of Allah, and prevents for the sake of Allah, then their iman is complete. So notice two, two different levels here. One is establishing salah, paying zakah, listening and obeying. That is the, he says, فَقَدْ تَوَسَّطَ iman. They've reached the middle level of iman. Or they've reached the center of iman, which is a very beautiful and high state. But notice the next state after that. The first state is regarding, you know, ibadat, acts of worship, salah, zakah, obedience. And then the next stage, loving, disliking, giving, and preventing for Allah. This is a greater stage. This is the foundation of this is ihsan. A person who has this, then he says, فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ iman. Their iman is kamil, it's complete. So if we think that our deen and our religion is limited to performing salah, giving zakah, just, you know, learning the ahkam and the rulings and obeying them, and not developing that love for Allah, not developing love for our fellow man, not developing these, you know, deeper characteristics, then we're mistaken. Because even the Sahaba, they're narrating these ahadith, which say that if we just do the ibadat, the work or the acts of worship, the ritual worship, then we have definitely had, we reach a good level of iman. But to reach the highest levels of iman, we have to have the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to dislike for the sake of Allah. We have to give and prevent for the sake of Allah. And that comes with ihsan. So essentially, this last point here, ihsan is the key which makes one a true believer and adorns one with good character. So this is basically everything that we are going to talk about regarding Ihsan. And I hope that we, we get that, that true fervor to develop these uh, good characteristics because I mean, all the different promises in the Quran of these different characteristics for the believers, the muhsineen, the mu'mineen, we can, we can actually get these qualities if we start with Ihsan, inshallah. So that was basically the third question that Jibreel alayhi salam posed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What is Ihsan? And we went over the answer. Now we have the last two portions of the hadith, which is question number four. Is akhbirni uh, anis sa'a. Jibreel alayhi salam asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, tell me about the day of judgment. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded as مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The person that you have asked doesn't know more than the person who has asked. So not the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't know, Jibreel alayhi wa sallam didn't know. No one knows when Qiyamah will take place. This is the secret of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then there was obviously the last question about the signs of the Day of Judgment. So we're, we'll get to that inshallah. So now I'm just going to go over many verses of the Quran which point towards the belief in Qiyamah. So this is a foundational belief in, in Islam. Um, it is absolutely necessary that we believe in the Day of Judgment because as believers we believe that there will be a day when we will be accountable for all of the actions that we do in this world. So we know that this world is a test. It's not for enjoyment. It's not for you know, you know, finances or, you know, getting a high position. Rather, it's to get a high position in the law with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here are some verses of the Quran, many verses of the Quran, which tell us about Qiyamah. So in Surah Al-Ra'ad, verse number two, يُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لَعَلَّكُمْ بِلِقَاءِ رَبِّكُمْ تُوْقِنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains his verses to you so that you will have conviction in meeting him. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you many different things, talks about the heavens and the earth, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives many different proofs of his existence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does all of this so that you will have conviction that one day you will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will realize that this Quran is really the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and what is everything in the Quran is the truth. The next verse, 
كيف تكفرون بالله وكنتم امواتا فاحياكم ثم يميتكم ثم يحييكم ثم اليه ترجعون so subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in the first few pages of surah al-baqarah how do you disbelieve in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when when at first you were absolutely nothing and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you life then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause you to die then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause you to become alive again he will resurrect you again and then you will have to go to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and answer for your actions. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Qiyamah in Surah Al-Baqarah, how we will be resurrected. In Surah Al-Rum, verse number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu yabda'ul khalq, thumma yu'iduhu, thumma ilayhi turja'un. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the creation and then he returns it back to the way it was, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. There will be a time where everything is destroyed. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will recreate everything again, which is Qiyamah. Then you will be returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the day of judgment. We will have to answer for everything that we do in this dunya. The next verse in Surah Tupaha, verse 15. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something about a sa'a. This is the word that is used in the hadith. Akhbirni uh, ani sa'a. Jibreel alayhi salam asked. Tell me about a sa'a. Sa'a means the hour or the, the moment. So meaning it's called a moment because qiyamah will, be, will come in a moment. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kalam hil basari ahu aqrab. When qiyamah comes, it'll be like a blink of an eye. One second, there's no qiyamah, there's you know the dunya. The next second, qiyamah will start. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause everything to be destroyed. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tupaha, Inna sa'ata atiyatun, that the moment is coming. Akadu ukhfiha. I would have kept it a secret. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not keep it a secret. Meaning, obviously, the, the, the time of Qiyamah is kept a secret. But the fact that there is Qiyamah is not a secret. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us this, that there will be Qiyamah. But in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have kept it a secret. That you know, no one would know that there is such a thing as Qiyamah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, لِتُجِزَ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا تَسْعَى So that every person will be held accountable for what they do. You know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell us there's a qiyamah, then someone could have the excuse that, well, I didn't know I was going to be judged, so I did what I wanted to. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us there will be a time where you will come back to life and you will be held accountable, and this life is nothing but a test. Now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, then we have to, uh, you know, practice accordingly, live our lives accordingly. In Surah An-Nisa, verse number 87, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu la ilaha illa hu, la yajma'annakum ila yawm al-qiyamati la rayba fih, wa man asdaqu min Allahi haditha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah, there is no other God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will absolutely, definitely gather you on the day of judgment, revive you, resurrect you on the day of judgment, yawm al-qiyamah. La rayba fih. There is no doubt in it. وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَدِيثًا Who is more truthful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens, the earth, He is telling you, He is telling I, that He is going to cause us to pass away, resurrect us, and then He will question us on Qiyamah. So this is the verse of Surah An-Nisa. Another interesting point, Qiyamah comes from the word Qiyam. Qiyam means to stand, like, you know, Qiyamul layl in Ramadan, we refer to Tahajjud Salah as Qiyamul Layl, standing at the night. So Qiyamah refers to us standing when we have to give the judgment. We have to give an answer for what we did. Just like the defendant has to stand in court, in the same manner, we will have to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we will have to answer for everything that we have done. Then in, in Surah Al-Dhariyat as well as Surah Al-Tur, especially the Makki Surahs, uh, if we go into Tafsir, we will know that there is 
uh, a distinction between the type of surah, whether it was revealed when Nabi Sallallahu was in Mecca, or if it was revealed after the Hijrah, there's a difference in style. So the Makki surahs speak extensively about Qiyamah. They paint amazing pictures of Qiyamah, very fearful, scary pictures of Qiyamah. We, you know, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, many ahadith said that if you would like to imagine Qiyamah, then recite these surahs. And he was referring to some of the surahs that are found in the 30th Jews, uh, most of which are uh, Makki surahs. So here we have Surah Al-Dhariyat, also a Makki surah. With Dhariyat Dharwa, Fal Hamilati Wiqara, Fal Jariyat Yusra, Fal Muqassimati Amra, Inna Ma Tu'aduna La Sadiq, Wa Inna Ad-Dina La Waqi'a. So here we can see how many oaths Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking. The more oaths that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes, the more serious the affair. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, by, and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says by something, it means I swear by. So by the, the spreading winds, by the clouds that hold a burden of rain, by the faljariyat yusra, by the waves that move. Uh, and the angels that have duties. So all of these Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about these different things and these are all uh, qasams or oaths of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا تُعَدُونَ لَصَادِقِ What you have been warned about, meaning qiyamah, is absolutely true. وَإِنَّ الدِّينَ لَوَاقِعِ And that day, the day of judgment and the day that we will have to answer for our actions, will definitely happen. And again in Surah At-Tur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wat-Tur, by the mountain of Tur, wa kitabi mas-Tur, and the written books of our deeds, fi raqi manshur, which is, uh, w- which will be laid out for us to read. Wal bayt al-ma'mur, and by the oath of the bayt al-ma'mur, which is, the, is similar to the Kaaba, it's of, above the Kaaba, where the angels make tawaf, wa saqaf al-marfu' and the oath by the skies, masjur, and the oath by the brimming ocean, inna absolutely the punishment of your Lord will definitely happen. There is no way, no one will be able to prevent it. So these different verses point towards the fact that Qiyamah is true, it is going to happen. And these verses are throughout the Quran is one of the most central themes of the Quran regarding Qiyamah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to practice upon what was said, to truly uh, imbibe within ourselves the, the qualities of ihsan and try to, to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq to continue with this hadith and finish it with afiyah and as well as the rest of the arba'een. وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <coughs> With your permission, I'll go ahead and uh, turn off. Okay, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair.